Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our second uh, sort of presentation in our, uh, it will now be our annual series from the Office of Michigan Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, on anti-racism. Um, today's talk in our series will be presented by Dr. Glenn Bracey. I'll introduce you to him um, at greater length in a moment. Uh, my name is Professor Christopher Chambers. I'm Assistant Professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology here at the Providence College. I'm also a faculty in residence at the Office of Institute of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. I want to um, just quickly cover a few logistics uh, for this afternoon's session. Um, Dr. Grace will speak uh, in a moment for about 35 minutes, after which we'll be followed by Q&A. Um, I want to invite you to put any questions or comments you have that emerge during the talk or afterward in the Q&A, uh, where we will retrieve them and, and use them as a part of our discussion. Um, I also want to mention that uh, we will be you know, monitoring the, ch the, the chat and the Q&A um, for your questions and comments, and to just basically ensure that everyone's here to sort of have a productive conversation. Um, I'm not anticipating any sort of Zoom bombing or anything the like, but if that occurs, uh, we will deal with it quickly. So I just want to make you aware of that. Um, before we get started with the introduction, I want to just sort of start off this series, uh, to our talk today, which is a quick uh, reported message from our president, Father Sicard. Uh, if you'll bear with me, I'm going to share my screen <clears throat> and I will share his message with you. Good afternoon and welcome to our second summer series on important subjects related to racial justice and equity. I'm grateful to the staff in our Office of Institutional Diversity, Equity and Inclusion for their work in putting together what promises to be an excellent series of discussions. I also appreciate the commitment of our faculty members, staff and students who will share their expertise and insights. By truly engaging with each other, we learn and we grow. And we have a good opportunity to do just that through this series. Our work toward becoming a beloved community continues and I want to reaffirm my commitment, which is shared across all levels of college leadership, including the Board of Trustees. We will not reach our full potential until we are a community where all of us can participate equally and justly. This is the way Jesus calls on us in the Gospels to live our lives, and it's fundamental to our Catholic mission and identity. We've made good progress by working together over the past year, but I'm the first to say that we have a lot yet to do. And your presence here today tells me that you're willing to join us in this work, and I thank you. Our presenters today have a lot of ground to cover, and we want you to participate so I leave you with my best wishes for an engaging and productive session. May God bless you and God bless Providence College. Okay. <clears throat> so I want to take a minute to uh, introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Glenn Bracey is an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Sociology and Criminology at Villanova University in Philadelphia. Uh, he has a PhD in sociology from Texas A&M. His writing and public speaking have all been on the topic of critical race theory, on the role of race in social movements, on activism and social justice and sports, um, and on the role of race in American religion. Currently, he is working on a multi-city study of racial dynamics in white evangelical churches. If you are even remotely interested in understanding more about that project, you can actually look at it online at rrjp.org. Uh, Dr. Brace, as I mentioned, will be speaking for about 35 minutes today, after which we will be happy to take your questions and your comments. Um, with that, I introduce Dr. Glenn Brace, who will be speaking with you today on uh, critical race theory and what it has to say about uh, religion. Dr. Bracey. 
Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Chris. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you to everybody from Providence College who uh, had a hand in bringing me. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. And I'm glad that we have a chance to talk about this subject that has been so much in the news, but uh, has been, I think, distorted in the way that it's talked about in the news, but it has a great effect on all of us. So uh, without further ado, let me dig into the presentation. I will share my screen up. Uh, I'm not allowed to share my screen. The host oh, is not able to share. There you go. <laughs> right, there we go. Okay, so uh, my talk today is from a paper that I've been working on for a little while now. Um, it's titled The Spirit of Critical Race Theory, Its Religious Roots and How It Speaks to the Church. I think that it's really important for the church to be involved in this conversation about critical race theory and what's going on for multiple reasons that we'll talk about soon. But for now, our first question is, well, when we say critical race theory, what are we talking about? What is critical race theory? Well, critical race theory is a literature and a method of analysis that critiques how race is shaped by, or how race shapes and is shaped by the law. So when we say it's, it shapes the law, we mean in terms of this jurisprudence, um, we mean in terms of, uh, um, in terms of uh, legal pedagogy, uh, or how the law is enforced is inflected by race. And when we say that the law racializes life, we're taking note of the fact that race is, the racial categories that we use are uh, legally created, that race has uh, puts li practicable limits on our rights in reproduction and immigration and education and activism. Uh, so all the structures of our society are racialized including the law. So critical race theory is, like I said, it's a literature and it's a method, but it is very uh, diffuse. It doesn't have extremely clear boundaries. So the things that unite critical race theory that bring it together are the six tenets of critical race theory. The first is that race is a social construction, which means that, uh, which means a recognition that there is no natural or objectively real way of establishing races. There are no genes or phenotypes that are present in all the members of one race and none of the members of another race. Um, the differences are, are arbitrarily drawn. And as a function of that, critical race theorists are anti-essentialist, meaning uh, we do not believe that your skin color de uh, determines your social behavior. There's nothing about being white in skin tone that makes one be racist, right? Uh, there's nothing about being black that makes me have a particular kind of social performance. We are, as critical race theorists, not essentialists. The second tenet is racial materialism. It's the notion that racial inequality is the normal outcome of US institutions and social relations. And to give uh, a, a, an example of that, um, if, if you ask most people, well, when was the last time, if you asked me, when was the last time you experienced racism? Most people would expect me to tell some story about being treated uh, cruelly, being called a name, something like that. But as a critical race theorist, what I would say is, I live in West Philadelphia. Every morning that I wake up in an all black neighborhood because of the history of redlining is an example of racism. Um, the fact that our schools reproduce racial inequality, our corporations reproduce racial inequality, is evidence that our, our institutions are designed to reproduce racial inequality, and that's the everyday materialism of racism. A third tenet is uh, the black-white binary, an effort to get past the black-white binary. So although American racism may have been structured around white-on-black oppression, other racial groups experience racism differently. So most African Americans, for instance, are English speakers uh, and did not have to worry about immigration. We were naturalized through the 14th Amendment and uh, birth. Um, you know, we don't have a land uh, to make sovereignty claims on, where Native Americans do have a history of land ownership to make 
uh, sovereignty claims on. And uh, Asian Americans, Latinos, et cetera, uh, face a lot of discrimination on the basis of uh, their first languages. The two more, uh, three more tenets I wanna cover uh, of critical race theory. One is a commitment to narrative. It's the notion that our national history and context of racism is important and should be thought about when uh, interpreting the law. So if a police officer were to stop me and I drove say a half a mile before I pulled over in order to uh, get to a place that's well lit, a police officer in the court may say, well, that's evidence of evasion or uh, an unwillingness to pull over for a cop. But in the context of our history of police uh, shooting black people, especially black men, uh, that, that logic makes total sense. And narrative uh, is not just the taking on of, uh, taking on our uh, awareness of our context, it's also communicating to the public in a way that people can understand. So using uh, everyday language, using fiction, using whatever means possible, even videos, other things to communicate what the law is, the critiques of the law, and how people are governed by the law is important to critical race theorists. One of the more controversial uh, tenets of critical race theory is the permanence of racism. So it's a recognition that there are white and black poles of racism with whites on top, uh, blacks on the bottom, and whites positioning other racial groups in between uh, in order to maintain that stability of, of exploitation. And this is really key. The permanence of racism is a function of white people's choices to hold on to racism. It is not a function of destiny. It is not an essentialist claim. So a white person can reject racism, but the permanence of racism is a recognition that most people, most white people will not choose to reject racism, especially uh, systemic racism. The last, uh, uh, tenet of critical race theory, and I want to draw attention to this one because it's the one that gets the most attention um, from the critics of critical race theory, is intersectionality. It's the notion that various identities can combine to create unique racialized experiences, and that those experiences, those identity-based positions, allow people to see and understand different facets of how race operates. So for instance, women of color have different access to understanding how uh, racism can be sexualized uh, that is different from my understanding as a black man, for instance. So now that we understand what critical race theory is, there's a basic question. Why must critical race theory engage Christianity? That's the, the claim that I'm making is that critical race theorists should engage with Christianity. And the answer is there is twofold. One is that much law, if race is going, if critical race theory is going to be an interrogation of race and the law, then it has to take account of the fact that much of the law, including race law, has a religious foundation. Um, this is clear about the re relationship between religion and the law from Justice Holmes, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, in, the, in 1952, speaking for the majority of the Supreme Court. He says, we are a religious people whose institutions presuppose a supreme being. In other words, the law and the Supreme Court and the enforcement of the law presume that there is a supreme being that whose will and interests must be taken into account in terms of interpreting the law. And that's true not just for law in general, but for race law in particular. So to give an example of that, I'll use a, a, a paradigmatic case um, U.S. v. Finn in 1923. This case followed a previous case from six months previous uh, uh, called Osawa v. United States, in which a Japanese man, Mr. Osawa, claimed that he could be naturalized under the 1790 Naturalization Act. The 1790 Naturalization Act said that only free white persons can be citizens, can be naturalized as citizens of the United States. So Osawa claimed that he 
was white, even though he was Japanese. And his argument was that he was white culturally. He was Protestant. He went to white schools and he was white phenotypically. His skin was lighter than some Italians, Greeks, et cetera, who uh, were being called white um, and being made white at the time. And the Supreme Court said that Osawa was not white because white is not about color. White is not about culture. White is about uh, is science. And if you are scientifically Caucasian. So then Mr. Thin took advantage of the law and said, well, I may be Hindu, but you said culture doesn't matter. And I may be dark skinned, but you said color doesn't matter. What matters is being Caucasian. And I am descended from the Caucasus Mountains. I am a literal scientific Caucasian. Therefore, I should be made white and I, I should be uh, recognized as white for the, under the law, and I should be naturalized and able to enjoy all the rights that a citizen can enjoy. And the Supreme Court issued a unanimous ruling. This is Justice Sutherland writing for the court. He says, he interprets, he, he, he interprets the law according to both the literal words of the law and the common Protestant, I mean, the, the common Christian understanding of the, uh, of the Genesis chapter that, that he references. So he writes, the words of familiar speech, which were used by the original framers of the law, were intended to only, uh, to, were intended to include only the type of man whom they knew as white. When they extended the privilege of American citizenship to quote, any alien being a free white person, close quote, it was these immigrants, notice this language, bone of their bone and flesh of their flesh and of their kind, whom they must have had affirmatively in mind. This language, bone of their bone and flesh of their flesh, is from the creation story where God creates woman from the rib of Adam. Adam wakes and says, she is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. The two shall be one, right? And after their kind is from Genesis 1, where God creates all the animals of the world and says, each one will reproduce after its own kind. So these laws were, were interpreted, the law was interpreted through this Genesis verse to mean that only white people as they, the smaller group that they understood were in keeping with the divine creation story of being after one's own kind, being bone of bone and flesh of flesh. And it's this kind of law and this interpretation of law derived largely from Genesis that justifies a whole host of racialized laws like immigration laws, naturalization laws, as in this case, the segregation laws, uh, segregation laws, really all the Asians. Um, come back to uh, this reading of the, the Old Testament. But there's a second reason why critical race theory must engage Christianity. And it's that white evangelicalism is currently driving the anti-critical race theory movement and is doing so in the name of Christianity in general. I'll give you two examples here. This is, uh, the first one is from John MacArthur whose uh, sermons are in 23 countries around the world every single day and whose statement the statement on social justice and the gospel has some 16,000 signatories, including churches all around the country. He writes, we deny that Christian belief, character, or conduct can be dictated by any other authority than the Bible. And we deny that the postmodern ideologies derived from intersectionality, radical feminism, and critical race theory are consistent with biblical teaching. Later, the Southern Baptist Convention, which is the largest Protestant denomination in the country, uh, in their, uh, their annual meeting, wrote a resolution on critical race theory and intersectionality. This is 2019, where they say, it is resolved that the Southern Baptist uh, churches and institutions repudiate the misuse of insights gained from critical race theory, intersectionality, and any unbiblical ideologies that can emerge from their use when absolutized as a worldview. So right now in the news, we can see that a lot of conservative uh, news networks, and I'll use Fox News as the largest, 
are up in arms about critical race theory. We see Tucker Carlson on the top there. Uh, President Trump uh, made orders against critical race theory. Um, governor DeSantis in Florida is one of, I think, 12 governors to have either uh, pushed for or actually signed a ban on critical race theory in education. Tom Cotton, the senator from Arkansas, uh, has pushed for a ban of critical race theory teaching in the military. So we're hearing a lot about this. And of course, we heard the most about it when President Trump uh, banned critical race theory teaching uh, in, in executive, uh, banned critical race theory teaching, oh, in everything that had it, uh, and everything in the federal government. And in his memo, he wrote, all agencies are directed to begin to identify all contracts or other agency spending related to any training on critical race theory or white privilege, and that such con and that all those contracts are to be canceled uh, and uh, to prevent, quote, un-American propaganda training sessions. But I, I point out that this obsession that we've seen on the in on right wing uh, media and in, and in conservative uh, political parties is new. It picks up around December of 2020 uh, and in earnest in March of 2021. But the church was focused on this as early as 2018 and has been building this movement and has finally gotten into the uh, conservative uh, agenda uh, writ large but it's actually driven by the church. So since this issue is driven by the church, since the, the criticism of CRT is driven by the church, we should pay attention to what the church is saying. We shouldn't just dismiss uh, Christians who are up in, arms, are up in arms about it. First of all, they're too powerful uh, to just dismiss. Uh, a lot of people are Christians and need to find a harmony between uh, their educations and their faith. And, um, and I don't think that this is a discussion that the that critical race theorists or the church need to avoid for their for their own sakes. So, what are the criticisms that evangelicals are levying against critical race theory? Well, the first one is that it has Marxist foundations. Uh, there's a claim that uh, critical race theory is based on Marxism. Let me say, plain out, that critical race theory and Marxism are not the same thing. That Marxism is concerned primarily with class and critical race theory obviously concerned primarily with race. Uh, they are, you know, what, 150 years apart in their, in their uh, creation and theorizing. Uh, the only thing that they have in common is something I think the church should get behind, which is Marxism and critical race theory are both concerned with eliminating exploitation of people uh, through social institutions and structures. And I think the church should also be behind eliminating exploitation of people um, through, uh, through social structure. The second is, uh, so I'll spend a little more time discussing the second and third major critiques that the church offers for critical race theory. One is that critical race theory and intersectionality in particular are postmodern and are therefore contrary to truth, to a singular universal truth. And the third is related that critical race theory and intersectionality prevent unity in the church by focusing on the differences in people's treatment. So how does critical race theory respond to those critiques? Give me just a second. Well, first, much early critical race theory was grounded in Christianity and in, in particular, and spirituality in general. So Christianity and critical race theory have never had uh, uh, an inimical relationship. They've, uh, they started, critical race theorists based a lot of their tropes and uh, a lot of their um, concepts on Christian, basic Christian understandings. To give you an example from the founder who's regarded as the founder of critical race theory, Derek Bell, he wrote a book in 1987, his first book, And We Are Not Saved, which And We Are Not Saved comes from uh, a verse in the major prophet Jeremiah. He wrote a book, his next, uh, not his next book, but uh, his third book is called Gospel Choirs. And Gospel Choirs is all about how 
uh, African American people can turn to the church uh, to sustain us as we're being mistreated through legal, um, as we're being mistreated through uh, uh, legal racism. So where does the where does the strength of the community come from? Where does the will to fight for justice come from? Derek Bell is very clear that we draw those things from our spiritual traditions, and then we move through uh, contests with the law with that foundation. Uh, his next book was Silent Covenants, which of course Covenants is drawing on the uh, Hebrew claim of the of a covenant between God and man, right? Uh, an unbreakable promise. And he extends that to talk about the covenant that whites have made with one another racially. But in order to understand the text, in order, you have to understand the Hebrew Bible and, its, uh, and, and what the significance of a covenant is. So there's, and that's just a few examples of the ways in which understanding the Bible is fundamental to understanding critical race theory. But I said they also use tropes, tropes like Christ-like figures like Geneva Crenshaw or Jesse B. Simple, uh, who are spirits um, and who move in and out of, of uh, being incarnate to uh, give wisdom, often spirit-based wisdom, to people who are, who are working against racism in this time. Uh, and finally, and I think most importantly, the core tenets of critical race theory imply some Christian principles. So one is Imago Dei. Imago Dei is uh, the notion that we are made in the image of God. It's from Genesis 1, 26. And, the, and, and it, it says, well, it says that, it, it says that we're all made in the image of God. I should say that, you know, and that we're, we're made uh, simultaneously that way. So the notion that we are separate species or that we are unequal is contrary to our creation. It's the notion. So the, the idea that race is socially constructed a critical race theory position is consistent with Genesis 1. The notion that uh, we can't pay attention just to what black people are saying or white people are saying, but that all, racial pe all racialized people should have a voice is consistent with the modern day. Same, same logic for intersectionality and for narrative, that if we use language or, uh, uh, or, or ways of speech that, that deny people access to the conversation, that that is a violation of the oneness that we were made in. The second, uh, a second Christian principle that I think is embodied in critical race theory is the notion of the institutionalization of sin. So the, the notion that a lot of us have is that sin is a, is a willful choice, but racism is, is something we talk about systemically. We talk about it both as a, an individual choice around prejudice and discrimination, but also around a systemic uh, pattern where our institutions reproduce inequality unjustly. But the Bible does talk about the institutionalization of sin. We see that throughout the minor prophets like Habakkuk and, and I, well, I could go into more, but long story short, we see where there are unjust kingdoms where God uh, steps in and, and deals with those, those sorts of things. So the materiality of racism draws on this institutionalization of sin uh, principle that's part of uh, Christian teaching. And this notion of the permanence of sin, even though sin is not, uh, sin has been overcome by Christ but we still find ourselves perpetually sinning, say Romans chapter seven, uh, as an example of that, is uh, reflected in the notion of the permanence of racism. So I want to pause here uh, just for a second and say, I wanna give you an example here of how what I'm saying functions. It's one thing, and, and I do make the claim that a lot of critical race theory, like I just said, draws on religious principles, Christian principles in particular, and therefore should not be antithetical to the church. But I need to respond directly to the claim that, it's, that intersectionality uh, is contrary to capital T truth and is uh, something that produces uh, disunity. 
So to do that, I'm going to use a particular scripture. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 23 through 25. And I want you to notice how it is in keeping, it recognizes social difference and then says how to address social difference. So here's the verse. Christians are all part of one body. Quote, and those members of the body, which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor and our less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more honor to, the, to that member which lacked it, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And in this verse, we can see that there are people who are, some are deemed honorable by society, some dishonorable by society, and that God uh, says to give more honor to those members who are deemed less honorable by society. So that the imago dei, the notion of, of equality of all people, is respected even as we recognize that society grants some honor to others, dishonor to others. And the solution that God offers in the, uh, in the first Corinthian text is the same solution that critical race theorists offer when they talk about intersectionality. It is to give more voice. It is to pay more attention to the voices that are speaking from a particular social position, the social position that is dishonored, not the social position that is honored and is already being heard. And that the result from a Christian perspective is not the disunity that the church is afraid of. It's not the dissolution of truth that the church is claiming, but is instead unity and truth. That is the claim that God makes in 1 Corinthians 12. So I don't want to give you just a, an exegesis. I, I, want to, um, I want to suggest that A, as academics and as people interested in the pursuit of knowledge, and in my own case, as a Christian interested in an honest pursuit of knowledge, that, Christ, that critical race theory should be protected as a tool that's in our toolkit to use to get at truth um, and to, to deal with racialized inequality and to recognize that in having that discussion, especially with Christians uh, of, of various stripes, that we can say, look, Christianity and critical race theory are not in conflict. Christianity, I mean, critical race theory drives, uh, derives from Christianity and in its, in its concerns around intersectionality, and its concerns around other critical race theory principles uh, like reparations or the importance of diverse representation or the importance of non-exploitative uh, uh, wages and, um, and the resistance of abusive capitalism. In all of those points, the Bible and critical race theory agree so that we can stop having the particular fight that we're having where the church is, is trying to take critical race theory away as a tool that we can use. And instead we can embrace critical race theory as something that brings unity and brings truth uh, to the church and to the academy. Thank you very much for your time. I really, I greatly appreciate it. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Bracey for your uh, illuminating comments and uh, insights this afternoon. I um, want to take the time to invite those of you that are watching today into the conversation. Um, feel free, please, to post whatever questions or comments you have for Dr. Bracey in the Q&A. Um, I believe you can also post them in the chat. I will do my best to navigate between the two of them. Um, if you have questions, feel free to do that uh, as soon as you're ready. Um, I think to get us started, Dr. Bracey, I want to pose a question to you that uh, came up in the Q&A during your talk. And it is about sort of the framing that you offer in your conversation about sort of the challenges to critical race theory, um, in effect, coming from, from largely, if not exclusively, conservatives. And the question poses um, whether or not you are aware that there are also more democratic or liberal folks or progressives who are equally concerned with critical race theory. The specific example that's been offered are uh, parents in New York City schools who are challenging critical race theory on the grounds that um, 
there should be a greater focus on uh, core subjects like math and reading, um, and that, um, sorry, I'm just gonna, I'm reading through the question quickly, um, that, that critical race theory is perhaps not appropriate to be teaching to young children, um, and that it sort of um, violates the idea that we should be teaching children to um, respect people for the content of their character, as opposed to reflecting and sort of oppressor versus privileged uh, sort of framework. Um, so I guess the question is both whether you are aware of sort of this more progressive sort of critique of critical race theory, and if so, what your response is to it, and particularly some of the claims perhaps that it might be making uh, in response to critical race theory. So that's an interesting question, I, and I appreciate it. Let me say first that um, I, I appreciate the, the recognition that there are some liberals who are concerned about critical race theory. I will say the data that I showed um, about uh, its proliferation on Fox News of late uh, was I selected that from uh, data that also showed its prevalence on CNN and MSNBC and showed that Fox News is far and way more concerned um, about critical race theory than those channels are, which reflects that conservatives are more concerned than uh, liberals are. But to deal with the, the critique that you know, liberals are offering, I would say uh, a couple of things. One, when people are talking about critical race theory, uh, commonly right now, what they're not talking about is the critical race theory I just described, right? So I, I've described the legal tradition and the, and the, and the uh, academic tradition around critical race theory. What a lot of people are concerned about is history itself, um, uh, the accurate teaching of our racialized history, um, whether we're talking about the 1619 Project or just uh, going through history period, and whether or not that should be taught to children. And frankly, it's hard for me to imagine a school setting where we're going to teach civics uh, in addition to math and science, right? We're also teaching civics, we're also teaching history. Um, we're, we're teaching about all kinds of social relations. That's where people are learning their social relations and, uh, and that, we would not, that we would not teach an accurate version of those things seems contradictory to the notion of an education. So, you know, whether the critique is coming from conservatives or liberals, uh, I think that teaching an accurate history is essential. And unfortunately, in the United States, our history is one of institutionalized racism, uh, in addition to many, many, many acts of bigotry. But we can focus on systemic racism uh, when we're talking about critical race theory. There was, uh, I think there may have been another point to that question that I've forgotten, but I hope that I've addressed it. Um, I think you've addressed some of the key elements. Probably the only other thing I would point out is the um, whether um, there's a sort of space in the interpretation of critical race theory of our racial history, our racial present that um, would agree with the idea that it is better to teach children or each other for that matter to deal with one another from, on the basis of our character and who we are than from the perspective of seeing one another as oppressor or privileged. I, I think critical race theory is essential to the project that we're trying to seek, right? If we're trying to have people relate to one another through the content of their character, then we have to first deal with the fact that we're, we live in a racialized society that is teaching us all kinds of ideas that have nothing to do with an individual's character uh, or an individual's behavior, but instead just stereotypes about race and racism that we have to first confront before we can deal in truth uh, with one another uh, through on the basis of our co on the content of our character. So um, critical race theory is not a threat to that project. Critical race theory is essential is an essential part of the project of uh, of not just being essentialist and grouping one another. Into, uh, into groups and treating each other uh, with a broad brush. Thank you. Um, another question that has come up regarding your comments about Marxism. 
Um, in effect, the question reads, I'm not sure I fully understand Marxism, but this seems to be most people hold up about the issue of critical race theory. How do you combat this concern and help others to be open about critical race theory? What's the last part? How do I combat this concern and what? And help others to be open about, uh, open to critical race theory. So you'll notice that in the tenets that I gave, none of the tenets say uh, Marxism, right? There's nothing about the proletariat or uh, the bourgeoisie or any of that sort of stuff. Um, I think people are calling it Marxist because Marxism is a scary word. Frankly, I think that's just, uh, that's just the politics. Um, but like I said, uh, so how do I combat that? Um, one, I think it's important to distinguish critical race theory from Marxism. I think that it's important to say what I did say, which is that Marxism and critical race theory are both um, challenges to exploitation, institutionalized exploitation, Marxism in the form of class, uh, critical race theory in the form of race and the law. Um, and that's the only intersection of the two, um, or that's the primary intersection of the two. So, you know, if someone's bringing up Marxism, I would just say that that discussion is largely irrelevant to the discussion of, um, of critical race theory. I, um, I want to pick up from there. Um, uh, and after that, I'm going to ask a question that just popped up. But I want to pick up from what you just described, Dr. Bracey. Um, what we, I mean, given, I mean, you mentioned at the start of your talk that um, we are, as a society, talking a lot about critical race theory right now. And it has become something that, um, in many respects, I think has continued to polarize us as a society. I think you've tried in your remarks to give us a sense that there is much about the conversation or understanding of critical race theory that current conversation misses. What would you say if you were to kind of boil it down to its essence component? I mean, what is, what are, what's the one or two things you think the current conversation most gets wrong about critical race theory that we really need to understand or reframe in our conversation? One is that critical race theory is not about uh, is not about saying that white people are are forever trapped as racists. Um, it actually, and it's in being anti-essentialist, it actually it holds out hope for white people. Um, that's the first thing. And two. Race and law are integrally connected in ways that most people can don't even recognize, um, but are really impactful for our lives. So I, I feel like I want I want I'm reaching for something simpler to say um, than there's this really tangled web of race and and uh, and law, but. If I was going to say it, like there's no way around the fact that our history and our laws have been set up to designate some people as white and therefore entitled to the better uh, social re the better of our social resources in the in the society, and to designate other people as non-white and therefore not available or not uh, have no access to those resources. It's that simple. And so a, a, a denial, a refusal to acknowledge the truth of history is, um, it just doesn't serve anyone. It doesn't serve anyone to, to be ignorant, whether intentionally or unintentionally. So we should embrace history and embracing history will, will lead us to critical race theory uh, perspectives. Along those lines, um, a question has come up asking how do we go about teaching critical race theory without characterizing modern white people as oppressors? Um, I, uh, this person writes, I believe Dr. Bracey said something along the lines of white individuals need to reject the institutional racism, but most don't feel, uh, don't, don't, uh, well, my, 
that I guess the quote is, white individuals need to reject institutional racism, but most don't. Um, person writes, I feel that to characterize modern white individuals as inherently racist is counterproductive to the equality movement. And then they go on to thank you for your presentation and they enjoyed it. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, if I, and uh, Dr. Chambers, help me make sure that I'm understanding the question here. Um, how does critical race theory position uh, whites as something other than oppressors? That's an interpretation of the question. I guess the more specific question is, is it possible to teach critical race theory without characterizing modern white individuals as oppressors? I think that's the most direct question. So I think the heart of teaching critical race theory is not about, is, is, really, is really about teaching systems of oppression and not teaching it as though it's about individual bigots. So when I'm teaching history, which I teach history before I teach critical race theory. Critical race theory only makes sense if you understand history. Um, I do a, a discussion of race and the law from 1607 all the way to the present. And one thing that I point out at the end of the discussion is that we never talk about individual bigots. We're only talking about social structures. Um, we talk about, uh, like, like I gave in, the, in, the, you know, in this talk, talking about the Supreme Court and the way that it and the Congress held certain rights and held certain privileges only for free white persons, right? So that it's not about saying, hey, individual white people, you're evil, you're bad, you're mean, you're whatever. It's about saying the country set up systems and institutions that privileged white people and, uh, and underprivileged the rest of us, or exploited, I shouldn't say underprivileged, exploited the rest of us, and that white people have a choice to make today to say, hey, I reject that. I know that I have been positioned historically to be in a position of receiving a series of unjustified benefits, and I'm going to figure out a way to not be the recipient of ill-gotten gain. It's, it's that simple. There's, a, there's, a, there's an opportunity uh, that white people have to, to, to do justice um, that critical race theory makes available to them. So it's not a story of uh, every mean old white person, but it can be a story of white people who succeed at turning away from ill-gotten gain. Um, as an extension of that, there's a question about um, whether that analysis includes or assumes uh, poor white people uh, who have little to no access to maybe power or resources. Um, where would, might they be positioned in a critical race theory analysis? So poor white people, um, I'm going to draw on Du Bois here, uh, have historically bought into the public and psychological wage of whiteness, which means that poor white people have bought into uh, you know, the jobs that were designated to be white did not just go to white elites. They went to poor whites as well. Um, the funding of all these schools and, you know, like white schools being funded more than schools for children of color covered poor white uh, students. The, the ideological, ideological apparatus of thinking of oneself as pretty, as smart, as intelligent, as belonging, um, seeing oneself in representation those benefits went to poor whites as much as they went to elite whites. So poor whites may not have all of the money to say give away in the form of uh, direct cash payment reparations, although that's not the request anyway. Um, so white people, white, poor white people may not have that and they may not have the position to say hire um, people of color but they do have position to speak up against racism. They can be marching in the streets with Black Lives Matter, for instance. Uh, they can push their churches to be more integrated. They have lots of opportunities to, uh, to participate in the justice seeking um, that, that, um, that my analysis uh, lends, lends toward. Um, I, I, I wanna conflate the question. A few questions here. 
that I think um, want to ask you to dig deeper into um, the, the sort of notion that critical race theory has connections to Christianity um, more so than perhaps to uh, Marxism. Um, and I think part of this question, as it's um, been framed here, deals with the way in which perhaps critical race theory as a perspective, um, while many criticize, while you offer the idea that critics um, who are challenging critical race theory tend to essentialize race over thinking about systems that perhaps the response to that only emphasizes conflict as opposed to reconciliation, um, therefore making it much more aligned in this person's view with Marxism than with um, Christianity. Um, and uh, well, and I guess, you know, there, um, how would you, how would you respond to that concern or perhaps that criticism um, and what leads you to this perception that we can make connections between critical race theory and Christianity in ways that perhaps are stronger um, and more meaningful than perhaps the claim that critical race theory is a, is a Marxist uh, objective. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to make... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm probably not the, I'd probably be the best out there, but I guess the question is um, to, to um, if if there's a if there's a correct reading or an appropriate reading, as you argue, uh, that links critical race theory to Christianity, um, say more about the ways in which it can do that um, in ways that are about reconciliation as opposed to. Um, basically just raising more conflict between people. Okay. How does Christianity connect us more deeply to, uh, how, do, how does critical race theory? Correct, more deeply to Christianity. <laughs> but yeah. Okay, oh, yeah, simpler way of answering the question, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, It's difficult because it's difficult because in all honesty, I think people have a choice to make on which one they want to see. And there's there's no um, there's no clear panacea, I don't think, or, or clear way of 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 saying uh here's a way of avoiding conflict but let, let, let me let me start again and, and say this plainly i don't think christianity critical race theory or marxism or or the status quo avoid conflict there is conflict the existence of racism necessarily is and creates conflict so our question is not how do we how do we steer away from conflict and uh, or how do we avoid conflict and and choose um, uh, some sort of unity? The question is how do we get out of the conflict we're already in uh, to to seek unity? And I think as a Christian and as uh, a critical race theorist, truth and dealing with the, the structures that we were talking about that produce that inequality um, and undoing those particular structures, providing reparations, which is a biblical concept, um, that is the way of bringing about unity. I, I agree with um, one point that Ibram Kendi makes at the end of Stamp from the beginning. Uh, he, he says, if you wanna eliminate racism, eliminate the inequality. Uh, and that's that's the way to go. If you want to eliminate the conflict, eliminate the inequality. Um, and the only way to recognize the inequalities, or one way to recognize the inequalities that we need to eliminate and how they function is through critical race theory. 
So there's there are going to be people who are upset when they learn about critical race theory. There are going to be people who are upset who when they learn about our racialized history. Um, but but we should not avoid the truth, a and b. When we say there are going to be people who are upset, we're overwhelmingly concerned about white people being upset, but we're not concerned about how the status quo puts people of color in a position of upset perpetually. And we need to see that uh, exploitation of people of color as intolerable and as, intoler as much an intolerable position as we see white people being upset. I think we have time for one more question, uh, Dr. Bracey, and um, it is, I guess, um, a question that, that came up earlier that you have to ask, which is, um, what would you recommend for folks who are interested in learning more about critical race theory in terms of text to read, um, particularly things that are empirical? What would you recommend? So I would start with, uh, I think I have it right here. I would start with this book, uh, Critical Race Theory, mm -hmm. the writings, the key writings that form the movement. Uh, it's the best primer on what critical race theory is. Its introduction would give you a history of critical race theory and, um, and uh, where it came from. It'll give you its true roots and it'll tell you what projects critical race theory is actually for uh, pursuing. So I would definitely read that. Then there are a series of, um, then, then I would say there's a book by Derek Bell that I didn't discuss called Faces at the Bottom of the Well, which captures a lot of the spirit of critical race theory and captures a lot of its in, in discussion of the law, but does so in fiction form so that it's more accessible and uh, interesting to a broader audience. Thank you. Any final thoughts or comments you wanna share with our audience before we let you go? I wanna thank you all for being here. And um, I appreciate the, one thing that I drew from the questions was a real concern about how do we get other people on board with moving forward with this? And I would encourage us to start and give them a healthy place to go. So, you know, I think with critical race theory uh, or with racial justice in general, if we do the work of producing institutions that are racially just, then people will have an opportunity to decide between the unjust reality they're living in and the just reality that we've created for them. And then people will make, a lot of people will make the positive choice. So, uh, and they'll do so joyfully. So uh, I, I wanna offer that as kind of a meta response to a lot of the questions that I got. And uh, again, thank you all for being here. Thank you to Dr. Bracey for being with us today and for sharing your thoughts um, and perspective on critical race theory. Um, I think that you've given us a lot to think about, there's lots of questions. Um, and um, I think we're really grateful for the time. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here today. Um, I'm sure we didn't get to every single question that was posed. Um, hopefully Dr. Grace will be happy to look at them uh, afterwards. And if there are things we can answer uh, on the website, we will do so. I want to make you aware that we are continuing our series. And next week, uh, Dr. Alex Orkiza will be talking about um, the Asian American experience, uh, both broadly um, and here at Providence College. So I invite you to show up next week for that conversation. Uh, thank you once again, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. Um, I look forward to seeing many of you next week. Take care.